Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to PhotoBiz Live. This is Joanne from the PhotoBiz team, and today we're joined by Texas Tim for a webinar titled, Let's Back Up a Moment. What would you do if your most important data disappeared, and how would it affect you and your business? The Senior Systems Architect at PhotoBiz, aka Texas Tim, will be giving an introduction to backups and strategies to help prevent such a scenario from becoming reality. In addition to getting the opportunity to learn from Tim in today's webinar, we'll also have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. You may submit your questions using the chat tool and they'll be answered after the presentation. You can also join in the discussion on Twitter by using the hashtag pound sign PhotobizLive. If at any point during today's webinar you have any difficulty hearing the speaker or seeing the slides, please use the comment box to let us know. We'll also be recording this webinar and it'll be available for replay on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash photobiz. With that being said, I'll turn things over to Tim. All right, good morning everyone. Thanks for uh, coming out virtually, I guess, to uh, this presentation. Um, let's back up for a moment. And what I mean by that is uh, let's basically talk about the topic that I don't think gets a lot of attention, um, sometimes the least amount of attention when arguably it should get the most, and uh, that's how to do backups and protecting yourself from uh, basically a data disaster. So um, I'm your presenter. I'm uh, Texas Tim. Um, I'm the Senior Systems Architect here at PhotoBiz, certified MySQL DBA. Uh, that's sort of my claim to fame. That's what I do. Um, I'm also a certified uh, Red Hat Linux uh, system administrator, and though it's not really the focus of this presentation, uh, I do contribute to the Holland Backup Project, uh, which is an open source tool for Linux to do uh, backups, mostly of databases, surprise, surprise, uh, MySQL and Postgres in particular. Um, I've been uh, with PhotoBiz since uh, 2011, and in my spare time, I'm a musician and DJ. Um, I have a small, interesting band, I guess, uh, with uh, where we... Uh, combine chip tunes, namely uh, stuff made using old vintage video game consoles with more modern genres. Uh, right now we're working on uh, combining acoustic elements with kind of a story folk kind of sound with uh, chip tunes. So, um, in like Game Boys and things like that. And it's, it's, it's pretty fun. I don't DJ as much as I wish I could, um, but uh, I am uh, I do favor, I guess, vocal trance and progressive house for those of you who like to listen to that sort of music. And I'm an avid scuba diver, if anyone's never been. Oh man, it's so wonderful. Um, it is the only time uh, that uh, I'm actually really calm <laughs> when I'm done doing something, because I'm usually a pretty excitable guy. And if you've been snorkeling, take that and times it by like a thousand, because it is just so wonderful, and it is very safe, contrary to what people think about. I mean, you do want to get certified, but um, it's it's absolutely wonderful, so highly recommended. Anywho, so uh, let's start by asking uh, just a simple question. Uh, with a follow-up. Where is your most important data and what would happen if it disappeared? And, you know, in my case that's a, a picture of my son, he's now three, um, That a, a picture I really want to keep. Um, for you uh, or any business it could be anything important, <laughs> right? Um, it could be your client's work, um, it could be important business documents uh, essential to the function of your business, any of that kind of stuff. What what happens if it disappears? and what would that mean for you and your business? Uh, well, the purpose of this presentation really isn't necessarily to answer that question. It's simply to avoid it. Um, and before we get started in that, let's uh, kind of a brief aside, but um, we'll do it anyway. And uh, that's kind of explaining the difference between digital and analog. And I think that, you know, I was trying to think about why backups aren't as important as they should be. And uh, I think it's because of analog, uh, oddly enough, because it's a different beast than digital. And I, I, people, I don't think, are totally used to what that means. For example, um, you know, analog is it's reliable and pleasing, or I think, um, so that's why it's on the positive side. But it is imperfect, which arguably I think is actually a benefit. Um, it, it is physical, you know, it's large and it's, it's expensive. But one of the things that uh, is, is neat about it from the reliability side is, you know, you can have a, a, a photograph, it might have a couple scratches on it, and you still know what's in the photograph. Um, you could have a record that you didn't take very good care of that has a bunch of clicks and pops and scratches, and for the most part, it still sounds like music, um, hopefully pleasing music. Um, on the music side, I find analog much better. Um, gives you that warm and fuzzy sound, and it's it's nice to see a trend of, of folks embracing that uh, a little bit more, um, which some astute folks um, that are, are listening might go, well, you're into vintage 
video game consoles, which are very digital. And yes, that's true, um, but it doesn't mean I don't like the quality that analog brings, at least in terms of recording. And it actually is a nice difference, even though we are using these sort of lo-fi instruments. Um, and in general, as a listener, uh, and even as a photographer, I just I love analog. You know, film grain is pretty. <laughs> um, digital is sort of the polar opposite. It, it's you you put in exactly what you get out. Uh, it's exact, hugely expansive. You know, consider how many tapes you would need to put the equivalent uh, music that might be on your iPod or records, uh, for that matter. Um, it's ethereal in that it it exists more as an idea. I mean, it, it exists concretely, but it exists on um, a medium, so it sits on top of your hard drive or your um, optical media or in the cloud. So it can it can really be anywhere. Um, as as a result, its source doesn't necessarily matter for what it is, um, and I think that's kind of a neat concept in, in a way. Um, it's expensive, inexpensive rather. Um, consider how much vinyl costs versus how much you can. I mean, you can listen to music for free now, thanks to digital. Um, and I could argue about whether or not that's always a good thing, um, but nonetheless, we have it, and and that's pretty amazing when you really think about it. Um, and it's ubiquitous. Everything's almost everything, rather, is, is digital these days. Um, the downsides are, uh, and the first one's probably the most important. It's error prone, and you know you can build in error correction to digital um, for for things, but for the actual underlying thing, like th- this, you know, DMG um, or MP3 or you know JP- JPEG, whatever you have, it only takes a couple bits to flip uh, in that file basically a couple of minor issues, um, for that file to have significant issues if not be totally unreadable. Um, and given how reliable uh, digital normally is, um, you don't have to think about that very often. But when it happens, it happens in much greater um, scope than it would say for a record getting scratched. Now, if I scratched my copy of Rumors on vinyl, I'd be really sad. But I could probably still listen to the music, whereas if I quote-unquote scratch the MP3, probably not going to happen. Um, and it's constantly evolving. You know, we're trying to talk about backups, some of which uh, might be data that you need to keep around for 20, 30 years or more. And if you can go back 10 years, look at how much uh, digital has changed. You know, 10 years ago, the uh, one in uh, some random number of people might have still had a floppy drive. Um, optical media was a lot bigger of an issue uh, or of a format, I guess. And today, now we have cloud. The spaces are, of drives are just ginormous. Um, so what, what is it going to look like tomorrow? You know, we have SSDs now that are neat, if unproven. Um, so I think digital is a false comfort, really, getting away from it. In terms of backups, um, it, I don't find digital very comforting as far as music generally, but um, it, uh, in terms of backups and how we deal with digital, you kind of assume it's always going to be there, and the reality is that, yeah, that's probably true most of the time, but when it's not, uh, it fails fairly spectacularly, um, and that's something to really consider as, as a takeaway. On the music side, I call it cold and unforgiving, and, and it's wonderful. Like we obviously, for for I'm sure almost everybody here, if not everyone, does digital photography, and uh, the things you can do are just amazing. Same is true for music, but uh, I find it does come at a, at a price, and and that is that what you put in is basically what you get out. Uh, when you looked at analog, you had these, you know, tube amps and in film side film grain and tape and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, you don't really have that with digital if you didn't put it there. So it, it, I think it tends to be kind of cold and maybe edgy, for lack of a better word. But that's an aside. It, it's here to stay, and uh, it has, in terms of keeping your your business data, um, you know, your tax receipts and what have you. Um, obviously, it's hugely important. Here's the takeaway: um, digital will fail. That is a statement of fact, or assume that it is. Uh, it is not if but when. And the sooner we adopt that idea, the more we can really start talking about, well, how do I solve that problem? Um, In in this particular case, this is not really anything related to the storage, this this picture here. It's actually a modem from uh, my mother-in-law's computer. Uh, They had a lightning strike a couple years ago, and um, this is the result. And I think I was able to salvage the hard drive. Not much else. Um, It actually came through the phone line, and they did have a surge protector um, on the electric, but did not have it connected to the phone. And then I think this happened to them again, and they still had a surge protector on the phone line, and it still failed, although not quite as uh, catastrophically as as this. So it's kind of a tangent as to what can happen to digital among the other things. Um, So, something to consider. So, uh, what does backup even mean? Um, Let's just go back to square one. Um, From Wikipedia, 
A backup, or the process of backing up, refers to the copying and archiving of computer data so it may be used to restore the original after a data loss event. Not a very interesting sentence, but uh, I think quick and to the point. What's a data loss event? Well, it's accidental or purposeful changes. So someone deleted a file under any circumstance um, and you need to get it back. Software bugs, uh, file system corruption, that definitely happens, especially when you consider how large uh, some of these hard drives can be and how much, how big a file system can get. That's kind of an issue. Component failure uh, could be a hard drive, and as an aside, it can definitely be an SSD too. Uh, I love SSDs. If you have a laptop, you should absolutely consider putting one in there because it's wonderful, but don't assume that it's any more or less reliable than a hard drive. It, it has de some definite pros and cons in terms of that, but we're really trying to talk about big picture here, and that could mean that your whole laptop could explode in a ball of flames, taking the SSD or hard drive out with it. So um, it's a wonderful technology, but is not a fix to this particular problem. Um, for, like I already mentioned, for example, theft, someone could just um, mug you on the street, which we hope doesn't happen, but you know, it could, it could, and steal your hard laptop, and then what? Um, and of course, large scale, I, I call them acts of God, but acts of whatever you'd like, large scale disasters, fire, flood, meteor, alien invasion, if, if you'd like, you want to be more creative about the bad things that can happen to humanity, how do we protect ourselves from that? Okay, so another concept here um, is, is talking about backup types. So um, we have full backups. Um, it's basically taking a backup of all your important stuff, the whole thing, every time you do a backup. Um, there's incremental, which does a full backup at every certain point in time, we'll, for in this example, Mondays. And then every other uh, backup in between the next full backup is taking a backup only of the changes made since the last backup. So as an example, we do a full backup on Monday. We do only the changes between that full backup and what has changed since on Tuesday. On Wednesday, we do all the changes that have changed since Tuesday and Monday's backup, so on and so forth. Differential is a similar idea and is really there to um, improve your restore time where you do a full backup on Monday. Tuesday basically is the same as an incremental. You just take changes from uh, the last full backup. But on Wednesday, you retake the changes that were made on Tuesday and then apply this, the changes that were ma then made on Wednesday. So as you can see, the longer you go with a differential, the more you're backing up each day because it includes all the data from the previous day. Um, and there's a little bit of, of repetition there, obviously, but you do that um, so you can increase your restore times, um, but obviously lengthen your backup times. Now, these concepts might not directly apply to you, depending on uh, what kind of backup solution that you use, but you may run into them, and uh, I wanted to provide an explanation in case you do. And um, Even if you're using something that sort of does this automatically, it's good to know what, what's actually going on under the covers. Okay, so let's define our backup needs. Um, I, we have risk you know, uh, retention, time, cost, and convenience. And then basically all that's really saying is um, when can I feel comfortable and sleep at night that I know that within a reasonable disaster that my data is still secure? How long is that going to take me to, to, to keep up with that? How much is all that going to cost me? Um, you, you're not going to get 100%. There's just no way that you're going to um, end up with a backup solution that's going to be 100% reliable. It could be 99 point a bunch of nines if you'd like. Um, but we're not going to get 100%. For example, you do all the stuff that you, that you can possibly do to back up on your uh, on your computer, um, or you know you you copy backups all across the country or the globe. Well, that's great. So now we have all this redundancy across the whole planet. Well, you know the uh, the meteor that took out the dinosaurs could take out the Earth as well, which I know is morbid. I'm not saying that's going to happen necessarily. I'm not saying it isn't, but. Uh, if that happens, then of course all your data goes away and you didn't copy it to Mars. Um, so you're never going to really get 100%. There's always going to be something either that you didn't anticipate uh, or that um, is just too expensive to, to be able to attain. But you want to get as far as you can be reasonably comfortable with it. And, you know, depending on what your situation is, it might not be so crazy. Just really depends upon what you're trying to solve for. Uh, another brief tangent here we got. RAID, because I know some people might be saying, well, I, I got this solved, I can just use RAID. Um, not necessarily the case, although it has some benefits that we'll talk about here in, in a sec. So for for noobs, I guess, of RAID, it stands for Redundant Array of in Independent Disks. And um, there's a lot of different RAID types. These are the most common. 
And to go through this real quick, so a single drive is nothing. You're not using RAID of any type. Um, it's just a drive. It might be what's in your laptop, for example. Uh, you have striping, which is RAID 0, which is basically spreading your data in a completely non-reliable way across multiple hard drives in an effort to increase space and speed. And RAID 0 does have uses. Uh, uh, backups, of course, are not one of them. Um, the opposite of that is uh, mirroring, which you mirror your data across uh, usually two or more drives. Um, and it's the same copy of the data all around. So um, from a performance standpoint, you do get a, a read bonus because you can read your data all at once off these drives. You don't get a space improvement because you're still using the same space as one drive. Um, but you get the reliability being however many drives you have in the RAID. Um, RAID 5 is kind of a compromise of both. You have to have three or more drives, and you basically are uh, interleaving what's known as parity across all three of these drives. Um, what that essentially means in layman's terms is that you can lose one drive, and you have the space of all the drives save for one. So uh, in, in this example, if these are all one terabyte drives, in a RAID 5 I have two terabytes worth of space uh, available to me, and one terabyte that's basically burnt on keeping uh, a reliable copy of the data, if you will. Uh, a RAID 10, my favorite, um, gives you only half the space of the number of drives, which have to be even, um, but does allow multiple failures um, and is super fast. So uh, it's effectively mirroring a, uh, each drive in a RAID 0. So take our RAID 0 example and basically mirror it, and that's what you have. So the cool thing about it is I could lose a drive in A, or green, the green drives. I could lose a drive in B or the red drives. I could lose a drive in C or the blue drives uh, all at once. And I could still be totally okay as long as I don't lose uh, two drives on, on one stripe. So I couldn't lose both the A's. Then I'd be in trouble. Um, so there's a little bit of, of fudging in terms of, of reliability. It means that at if you got really unlucky, you could only handle one drive failure. But if you got really lucky, you could handle, in this case, up to three. Um, and it is very fast. Of course, again, the downside is you lose half your space. Um, but in, in enterprise scenarios where speed is, is paramount, um, you get both reliability and just a crazy amount of speed. And there are other RAID types, again, as I mentioned, RAID 6, RAID 4. Um, there are proprietary RAID-like solutions, um, but these are sort of the standard ones. Um, and I am a big fan of RAID, huge fan. But I will say, RAID is not a backup. Okay, it's You can increase your redundancy, that's awesome. Generally increase performance, that's cool. You can increase your uptime, wonderful. Um, but you cannot protect yourself from accidental or purposeful deletions, file system corruption, the chance of multiple drive failures, uh, the total loss scenarios, again, acts of God, meteor, aliens, what have you. Um, any number of those things can still wipe out your RAID and wipe out all your data, the most common of which I would say being accidental or purposeful deletions. That can easily happen, and RAID is not going to do anything to protect you. And in fact, RAID is going to make recovering that data much more difficult if you're going to go to a professional recovery uh, company like Drive Savers, because now you have to send them all these drives in your RAID, you have to figure out how to build all this data together. Gross. It's just it's not a backup, so it's not going to work. Um, but I am a fan of it, and uh, for other reasons, obviously, it would be a really good idea to use it um, if you're using you know a larger workstation, um, you know, say your main photo editing machine or what have you. Um, good idea generally. So to, to dig a little bit deeper, uh, if you do want to do RAID, you have a couple of options. Uh, we can talk about external RAID. Um, an expensive one, but one I'm really kind of fond of, um, if don't have a direct experience with, is the Drobo. Um, and it is one of the proprietary RAID options. So you basically just shove a bunch of drives in it, and it kind of figures out what it needs to do as far as your reliability. Um, so you don't need match drives. You can just find drives that are lying around that you're no longer using, just slam them in there, and it'll figure it out, which is kind of neat. Um, you have a more conventional solution like the Buffalo Terra Station or any QNAP device, um, which implement RAID more conventionally um, in terms of these RAID 0, 1, 5 kind of things. Um, if you're a more enterprise customer, you can use a dedicated storage server, um, something like uh, what is it? Microsoft Windows uh, Storage something, <laughs> or Windows Server, or Linux, or OS X Server, uh, or a uh, dedicated proprietary uh, sort of off-the-shelf backup solution. Uh, Barracuda Networks, for example, has a backup solution. HP and Dell likewise have um, their own type of dedicated solutions that you can use that don't involve sort of managing your own server. Internal RAID might apply to more of you. Um, if you have a, a larger like desktop machine at home that can handle a couple drive bays and you don't want to use an external ugly box, um, you'll probably find if you're using a reasonably recent version of any modern operating system, you're going to have uh, RAID options. Either you can use a hardware RAID controller, 
uh, which I won't talk about too much, but they exist, and you can get them, uh, and they generally have good performance. Or you can use Software RAID, um, which comes with the operating system and is not quite um, as as fast, at least in a desktop environment, but um, can be can be done um, and will help increase your reliability. Um, Windows 7 and 8 and OS 10 all have um, RAID type solutions. Windows 8 is kind of neat because it has um, these notions of storage spaces, which OS 10 kind of has, but doesn't let you play around with it too much via its uh, Fusion stuff. Um, so the others are kind of more conventional RAID. And likewise, if you're a big Linux fan, which would make very make me very happy if I knew even one person used Linux in this, in this webinar, but if you do, um, you do have options for software RAID via MD um, that you can use as well. So pick your poison there. Um, all the modern OSs are going to have some sort of support for you. Um, between the two, a hardware RAID solution is going to be a little bit more reliable because it does not rely on the operating system to do the RAID stuff. So you can have um, better recovery options. Um, and with software RAID, you're going to have to, if you something bad happens, you have to reinstall the operating system and then figure out what the RAID is doing. Um, but it is cheaper to do software RAID. And, you know, if you just want to do a RAID 1, just buy two drives of the same kind. Buy one, buy why buy one when you can buy two for twice the price, right? Um, slam them in your machine and uh, go into your, you know, RAID configuration utility uh, for whatever operating system you have. Uh, Windows 7 and 8, it's like control panel, uh, administrative tools, disk management. It's not in a very friendly place. I think storage spaces is. Uh, it's also in the control panel. And then OS 10, you just go to uh, disk utility and you can configure as need be. And there's a tiny little screenshot on the right that shows you kind of what it would look like. All right, so that was RAID. Um, and again, it's not a backup, so it was a tangent, but I think it was an important one. Uh, now we're going to talk about actual backup solutions. So easiest thing to do, regardless of this RAID and all this fancy stuff, is go go out, assuming that you're running Windows 7, 8, OS 10, Linux even, um, go buy a hard drive. You know, it doesn't matter. Just buy a big one. You know, spend a, a hundred, one to $200 on it. Plug it in using USB or your favorite interface. Turn it on. Enable backups, magic happens. And you can see the two screenshots on the right, uh, Time Machine on OS X and Windows Backup there in, in, in the back. Either of those two operating systems have this thing built in, they work, you just have to turn it on. Um, so if you do nothing, if you have no backups today, do that and, and you will be happier because when a failure does happen, at least you have an option um, to take a look at it. So um, it's, you know, built in backup software is great. Um, it has some clear uh, benefits. It's auto magic in that you don't have to really know how it works for it to function. Um, the operating system comes with it. It's generally inexpensive because you just have to buy a drive. It could be a USB drive, you know, whatever. And for the most part, you can do bare metal restores, which is basically sort of a total restore from I lost all my, the whole operating system, the hard drive blew up, I, I need to completely start from scratch. Um, generally, at least for Windows uh, and OS 10, you can restore just from the built-in backups and be up and running. Now, the downside is that it is auto magic, so you don't know how it works. You just kind of assume that it does. Uh, it's I would say it's not quite as redundant um, in terms of managing something on your own, again, because you don't totally know how it works. And I've had Time Machine fail, such as that little screenshot on the bottom right. Um, and generally, these things are kind of built for single location, set it and forget kind of stuff. When we start talking about more uh, advanced topics, you're going to probably run into a wall with, with some of these on how it's going to function, so something to consider. But they do work, and if you do nothing else, if you have no backups today, I can't say this enough, do this. Um, I, I have quite a few stories of people losing all their data just because they didn't think about backups, and I think in some cases we told them to run backups. They still didn't, and then bad things happened. So, you know, data failures are just going to occur. It's part of your digital life. And if you do nothing else, do this. Now, if you want to make it a little bit better, um, we're still talking about, you know, uh, using built-in backups or just a very simple backup solution. And you're worried about things like fire or flood. Um, this doesn't protect you from everything, but I'm I'm a larger fan of these fireproof hard drives. Uh, I actually just recently purchased one um, from IOSafe, although there are other vendors. And basically, they're like a fireproof safe that you would store your paper documents in, except that they are reliable enough. Um, to handle um, keeping your hard drive safe during a fire. A standard fireproof safe generally isn't going to get you there. Um, it's better than nothing, but those safes are largely built around making sure paper doesn't catch on fire, 
spontaneously. They're not really built around the tolerances that uh, hard drives would require uh, if there was a fire. So a fireproof hard drive is a little bit more advanced. Uh, I've I read somewhere where they have like water suspended somehow in this thing, and when it burns, it, it anyway, magic happens. So um, I like them. They're a little bit more expensive, but they're simple. You can get insurance. I wouldn't necessarily bank on that, but they will do data recovery for you as part of the guarantee on the device, at least for a period of time. Some of them have RAID. I think the one pictured does. Um, some of them have NAS. If you're using um, it on multiple computers, you have options there. They are expensive. They don't protect you from theft. If someone really wants to get in there and steal your data, um, outside of things like encryption, um, which is another topic. And again, total loss scenario. Um, if a meteor hits your house and happens to strike the safe, um, that you're not, you're not, might not going to be able to recover that. So, uh, you know, keep keep that sort of in the back of your mind if you're going to use these. But I think regardless of whatever backup solution you use, they're really actually quite neat. Um, and if you can afford them, uh, I would definitely at least take a look at it. Now, we're going to be getting a little bit more advanced. And, and fortunately, the built-in backup solutions don't let you do that uh, as easily um, without having maybe a couple of headaches you might run into. Um, and you might want to find, you might find rather, that you want more control. So um, there's a number of backup solutions. I have pictured here Nova Backup for Windows on the left. Super Duper uh, for Mac on the right. Um, on the Windows side, uh, I've had some periphery use uh, with it. Seagate, which is a hard drive maker, also makes a backup tool that ships with some of their hard drives. The function's kind of like Windows Backup, um, I think with a few extra doodads, so you can look at that as well. Um, on the OS X side, I haven't really find, found a lot of awesome solutions. Super Duper's kind of my favorite. Um, it doesn't really have you know, things like incremental uh, backups as I have defined them previously, but it, it is neat and it will get you there depending on what you're wanting to do. Um, it's kind of cool because it can make full image backups, so you can image your entire computer, um, which you can do without using Super Duper, but this makes it a little bit more convenient. And if you buy the paid version, you can do incremental backups with those images as well, so kind of some neat neat things there. Um, if you're not really comfortable with those concepts, I would say don't worry about it. Um, for now, uh, you can look at Super Duper if you like, play around with it, but um, if if you can't think of a real reason why you would need to make images, then you can just use Super Duper as sort of a standard backup. Um, likewise, Nova Backup really isn't built for bare metal recovery on, on Windows, but it does have the concept of incremental differential backups, and you can put backups in different places, and it gives you a lot more options than you would normally have available to you. And it's not excruciatingly expensive, although I will say I hate those ads on the side. If you look at that screenshot, it's it anyway. It's it doesn't have the best UI ever invented on the face of the planet, unfortunately. Okay, so uh, now we have this. Say we're using a third-party backup solution, and we're trying to make things better. So we want to solve the total loss scenario problem of your house or office catching fire. Which don't get me wrong, would be really unfortunate. I do not hope that happens to, or I hope that doesn't happen to anybody. But again, we're planning for the worst, so we got to be a little bit morbid. How do we make that better? So. Simply put, we can put backups somewhere else other than where we mostly uh, inhabit. So, uh, offsite backups, here we are. Um, they do allow for increased data redundancy, um, geographic redundancy, at least to a degree, depending upon where these backups actually are, longer retention um, by means of the system, um, and increased security, because now you have, I guess security is kind of an open term. It, it more. Um, Increased security in that uh, it's not so, so much to say that someone still can't come into your office and steal something, um, if you, at least you have a local copy of backups there, uh, but more so that you can now plan for bad things. Um, if someone does steal your data, you still have the ability to get to the data. Um, they're more costly, obviously. They generally, not always, but generally involve manual effort, at least if you're trying to keep costs down, um, They, which means they require upkeep. It's not unlike Time Machine and, and Windows Server Backup. Um, you know, you just have to maintain the thing for it to work, and as a result, uh, it tends to require more time. Um, so, there's a couple ways to, to look at this. Um, first, obviously, some just general offsite locations to think about. If you're really worried about it, you can use a service like Iron Mountain and pay for someone to store your data in a secure, unknown facility that has armed guards or, or what have you. And I think in the case of Iron Mountain, they'll actually come and pick up your media so you don't have to drive it across town or wherever it ends up going. Or I think you can mail it off depending on where you live, and have them store it you know, multiple cities away, which might be a good thing. If you have another office, depending on where it's located and how your network is connected, um, you can link the two together using um, something like a VPN, 
uh, or whatever you'd want. I can talk about that, by the way, but um, I don't want to get too deep in, into those details. So if you have questions, ask me later. But you link the two sites, and now if they're linked by a network, you can do backups to remote locations um, online without having to, to pass around hard drives and stuff to, between these locations, which uh, for businesses might be ideal, at least if you're a larger business. Um, keep in mind that if your backups are connected to the network, then you do risk someone going in and deleting the backups off the network. So um, if you do that, you still might want to have sort of... Um, offline backups where you actually have a drive that is connected to nothing is not powered on and is stored in a safe place just for that that particular scenario um, along those heels if, if you wanted to you could just do a safe deposit box put a drive at a friend's house that you trust at home you know what, what have you just try to put it in a safe place and again if you can afford it that fireproof safe sorry fireproof hard drive probably a good idea so this is the rule from IOSafe um, that is pretty easy to follow. So I wanted to mention it. Uh, three, keep, three, keep three copies of your data. Um, keep them in at least two separate locations on, on two separate systems. So in other words, um, if you have multiple office locations, um, you would have two backup servers, one on each end, and they're handling backups between the two. Everything's cool. But make sure that that third backup or third copy is off-site and offline, I would add as well. So for more information, there's the link. Uh, it's a pretty good write-up, and you can apply it whether or not you buy their fireproof safes or not. <laughs> um, a sort of poor man's solution to having all this fancy enterprise-related gear, if you're a very small shop or you're doing personal backups, I, I like this because some upfront cost, not a lot of upkeep if you're willing to put in the time. And I've called this the Griffin solution, um, which I coined a, a friend of mine at Rackspace uh, when I used to work there, uh, came up with this when I was trying to come up with my own backup solution that was cheap. And one of the things that he pointed out was that my first solution did not account for transit uh, or uh, in some cases big failures that could happen um, while you were carrying around a drive. So his solution uh, tries to fix the, the transportation problem while making sure that you always have at least one drive somewhere. So to go through how this kind of works, you buy three drives. Okay, one you're going to keep, you're always going to keep one at least one drive in, in, in both locations. We'll say home and office, because that's what it was for me. Um, the place you make your backup, for me it was home, so I'm, I was doing some backups of all, of all my pictures and what have you. So uh, I have two backups at home, as a scenario, but this graph goes from top to bottom, so this is the first picture, if you will. Um, I have two, pic two um, drives at home. Uh, I do backup on, say, the red drive, um, and then... Um, well, we'll say the blue drive for the next next example. So I'm doing backups on the blue drive. At some point, I'm like, all right, I'm ready for this backup to, to be placed in the office. So I, this is the second step, drive it to the office. Okay, so during this period of time, now I have a drive in all three locations, three being, the, the middle being, of course, in the car. So if something bad were to happen in any of those locations, I'm still protected. Okay, so I get the drive to the office. Now the office has two backups. The yellow drive is the oldest backup. Of course, the blue one is just the one I just put there. At home, I'm still having my red drive to come along doing its backups. So now I know that the yellow drive is old. It needs to go back and, and refresh. So I take the yellow drive, br again, bring it back. So now I have three drives in, in uh, three locations, or a drive in three locations. Take it home. Now I start backing up on the yellow drive, because the yellow drive is basically old and needs to be refreshed. So start doing backups on that. And consequently, I need to take the red drive, because it now has the freshest backup, bring it to the office. And you basically repeat this strategy um, forever, essentially, um, on whatever schedule that you set. So you could do this weekly, monthly. Um, the longer you, you take to cycle the drive in your office, of course, the older the backup's going to be, um, which might be a good or bad thing, depending on what you're wanting to solve for. Um, and so just to point out, I, you know, the, the, the scenarios of, of terribleness that could happen to you um, are all covered um, in this scenario. So there's never a period of time where you could stand to lose your data as long as you have something bad happen in only one place. In some cases, two places, but uh, we're generally trying to solve for um, you know, a, a single failure. Um, and, and I do hope, by the way, no one in, is involved in an accident at all or while transferring your backup drive to your office or home. But um, if it does, the point is that this will get you covered. Uh, and all you have to do really is buy three drives, uh, plus use some of the more advanced backup tools, um, and you're covered. Uh, now, you know, it is cheap. Uh, you can do offline backups, which is good. 
so that you, someone can't go in and, and delete your backup if it was online. Um, as long as you trust the place that you're storing it, you've, you generally are pretty well secure. It does take a pretty large amount of manual effort, um, and plus the distance and time are sort of proportional to each other. So if your office is 15 minutes away, that's fine. But if if it's that close, then depending on what you're trying to solve for, you could have a problem. So if you have a large-scale flood, meteor again, aliens, what have you, um, this might not be the best solution. But again, if you're a small business owner or just a person and you want to keep your backups uh, in a reliable way where you're not going to risk losing them, uh, it's a solution that works pretty well. Um, feel free to poke holes in it if you'd like. Um, there could be better solutions uh, for sure, but uh, it's one I found was was both cheap and if you're willing to put in the effort, uh, it has, has a pretty good payout for reliability. So for people who don't like to have spend gross amounts of time in those types of backups, uh, enter the cloud. And I will tell you, I am not a huge cloud fanatic at Right Tool for the Right Job. It has a number of benefits, but I I guess I want to stress that this is not necessarily a, oh, this is fine, I can just back up to the cloud and I'm done. Um, it's the same kind of problem that we described uh, at, at the very beginning of the presentation with, how do I keep my data for 30 years? And if you add to that, then you have to have trust and all sorts of stuff. But back to things like Time Machine, it's auto magic. Um, the, the word cloud I find really annoying because um, it doesn't mean it exists everywhere in this magical ether. It exists in a data center. Um, but you don't have to worry about the implementation details, which is both a good and bad. So you, it just works. So the reliability and replacing of hard drives when they fail and all that type of stuff is handled by the cloud vendor, not you. Um, it's easy. Most of the cloud backup tools are pretty cake to run. Um, you just turn it on, tell it what to want back up, and press the go button. Uh, redundancy is, is touted as a huge feature. So, you know, um, in the case of uh, Rackspace, I think they say that they keep at least three copies of your data more if it's hot. So, um, you know, there's that. Obviously, it's offsite. It's offsite, but it's online, so you have to keep that in uh, account. And it's distributed at least to a degree, depending on your vendor. Automagic is, 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 of course, a downside. Um, the probably the second biggest one is if not the first, is the time and bandwidth. They're proportional to each other. If you have a very slow connection to the internet, especially your upload speed, it could take ages to upload anything of, of significance to the cloud, and consequently on a restore, it could take ages to pull it back down. So uh, keep that in mind. The more data you store on this thing, um, the longer it could take. And if you have a huge amount of data, you know, it could take you days before you're able to copy all that stuff out of the cloud. Um, so it's a very slow uh, solution by by consequence. Um, a massive amount of trust um, in, in your vendor because uh, a lot of these use closed source solutions, not all, but a lot, and you really have to trust that they're not going to be turning your data over, oh, I don't know, to the NSA or to your competitors or trouncing through it or you know any of that type of thing. So if you trust them, great, but just be sure, don't pick the first cloud vendor you see um, and assume that just because they say the word cloud that they've got your back. Um, I would argue there's, there's a case to be made for paying a little bit more for a cloud solution uh, with a reputable company than, than a, a new newcomer, unless they complete their case fairly well to the point, you know, of course, you're happy. Um, it is unproven, generally. I mean, the, the, the system that they these cloud vendors use is, is not, you know, super crazy. Um, a lot of these run Linux, and they're doing... Um, types of replication that a lot of the technologies that are, that are building this have been known for a while. So in that respect, it's kind of mature, but unproven in that how you're interfacing with the cloud, how it scales, um, how things are going to change as data uh, storage changes, um, things like that. Um, there's the ownership piece, which kind of goes back to security and NSA thing. And of course, the cost, which is kind of also relation, uh, relational to the amount of stuff you're backing up. Um, when I did the calculations for me, I was willing to pay up to about 40 gigabytes worth of backups. And after that, I was like, this is just too expensive. Your business might be able to pay more. Um, but it, the idea of being able to store four terabytes in the cloud is both a slow and expensive prospect. So um, that's something to keep in mind, is that you might want to use the cloud for some of the more important stuff if you trust your vendor enough. Um, but I wouldn't just put everything under there um, without realizing how much you're going to end up paying for it. So, a couple vendors for you. Um, I, in full, in, you know, openness. I used to work for Rackspace, as mentioned. So, um, Jungle Disk is my favorite. But you know, go ahead and look at all the vendors that you want to look at and find the one that, that fits you best. 
I've heard good things about Carbonite uh, as well as Barracuda and Mosey has a really good cost benefit but um, they tend to be at least a friend of mine used them and it was excruciatingly slow so um, sort of keep that in mind um, I, I have used Jungle Disk directly and I uh, it, it, it's consistent it works it lets you use multiple cloud uh, storage vendors Rackspace being one of them um, so and it runs on all three major operating systems Windows OS 10 and Linux um, so but again do your own research make your own judgment um, uh, the point is though a lot of these are, are pretty pretty easy to use so um, just as a brief aside what is not a cloud backup vendor directly would be using Rackspace's cloud storage solution directly or Amazon S3's or Amazon's for that matter um, and in addition Dropbox and SkyDrive amazing I love Dropbox huge fan but it is not directly a backup. If if you're running, you know, if you put all your images, you put your Lightroom catalog uh, in Dropbox, that's great, and you can distribute that to all your computers, everything's cool. Um, it doesn't fix um, someone from deleting everything in your Dropbox folder. And Dropbox does have some protection for that, um, but it's not necessarily automatic, and I still would not call it a backup, because you're not really putting data somewhere else. And the whole, well, part of the point of having a complete backup solution is having redundancy in, in that regard. So if you put all your eggs in the Dropbox or SkyDrive basket, um, you might be asking for trouble if, if the right bad things happen to you. So don't do that um, necessarily. Instead, you could use Dropbox as a backup and copy data that um, is important to you, or the converse. You take data that you usually put in Dropbox and back it up on another hard drive in your office or at home and store it offline. So you certainly can do that, but they by themselves are not. Cloud Files, likewise, has a ton of redundancy, so does S3, but you, it's really just a raw storage mechanism. It's akin to a hard drive, and so you need to have some support on top of it um, to handle that. Now, the good news is that most of the cloud backup vendors from the previous slide are using Cloud Files or S3 or, or something else, um, so they get all the reliability of that system while adding in things like multiple copies, data duplication, and some fancy things to give you a complete solution. So. If, if you're going to use cloud backup, I would recommend you use a specific cloud backup vendor. Chances are good they're going to be using one of the well-known cloud storage companies. Okay, so enterprise solutions. Uh, almost done. <laughs> and uh, so I didn't want to... This is a huge topic, and that's it's only one slide. So uh, these are just some ideas to think about, and if you have questions, I can certainly address some of them. Um, if you're a larger company, centralized, preferably offering operating system independent backups is possible uh, depending on what type of hardware you use. You can do tape backups, iSCSI is amazing, um, DAS or SAN uh, are things, technologies to look at if you need to store a huge amount of data. Um, at, at this level you're probably looking at one or more dedicated storage servers either that you build and manage on your own or that you purchase from a vendor. Um, doing all that gives you things like auto site mirroring and uh, fanciness and it, there's all sorts of fun stuff that you can do. Um, iSCSI in particular um, I've really warmed up to as being a really neat solution uh, when you're wanting to do vendor specific backups on an independent architecture if that sort of makes sense. So um, if anybody if this hits anybody's points then uh, they'll, you know, we can talk about it in the q and This presentation is really focused on Squares 1. right? You didn't have any backups and you need something. An enterprise solution is really how do I back up my whole office? You know, um, and you may, if if you need that, there are solutions available. But uh, if not, these are tend to be complicated and costly over doing something sort of on the cheap. So some general suggestions. These are hopefully takeaways. If the rest of this was mud, <laughs> so nothing else. Buy a drive, plug the thing in, turn on your built built-in system backups. If you do nothing, at least do that. It costs a hundred dollars one time to buy a hard drive, maybe two. Um, and it will take care of you if you had nothing. And you know, I, I mean, I, I fortunately when I was working at Rackspace, I never had the the I guess uh, pleasure, for lack of a better word, of having to talk to someone directly who didn't have backups uh, after they lost data. And um, you know, some of those cases we were very specific, saying, "Hey, we, you need backups. Here's the things that we offer, or you can do it on your own, but you need these." And you know, people didn't do it. Um, and you know, it, as you can imagine, things can, can get uh, emotional um, when that doesn't happen. But these days, it's so easy to solve. Just plug in a drive, turn it on, call it done. Um, and, and obviously, given what we talked about previously, that you know, there's some circumstances, but to consider. But 
going from no backups to backups is already a huge jump, so at least do that. Help me sleep at night knowing that you did that. <laughs> Find a realistic goal with your backup solution and work towards it. So again, you can't, there's no way you're going to be able to do 100% reliability. Earth could blow up, like I said earlier, but figure out what, what your goal is going to be, given what we've mentioned or, or what you've been thinking about, and work towards that. You know, put in a budget for backups, put in some time, um, and, and sort of uh, paint the landscape, as it were, of, of what you're trying to do, um, and then just just work towards it. Don't just try to willy-nilly just be like, well, I need to back this up somewhere. Let me just go ahead and throw this in a thing. <laughs> right? That's not, that's not going to work. Uh, instead, you know, you can look at using Time Machine or your OS backups for, you know, uh, your normal stuff. You might have um, another uh, backup tool that you use to back up your most critical data. You might look into the costs um, and logistics of using an external drive at an offsite location. You know, figure all that out and figure out what you're trying to do and what scenario you're trying to solve for. Never floods in your city and you want to flip the coin on if, if you're never going to have a fire. <laughs> um, okay, you know, th if that, if that uh, solves your goals, then by all means, do that. But find that goal um, and then work towards it and make it sp specific. And this, and this is a very important point. This is all a huge, gigantic waste of time, all of our times, actually, and money, your money in particular, um, if your backups don't have your back. And what I mean by that is if you don't verify that your backups are actually working or that your software is functioning or any of those types of things, and you can verify to your uh, degree or, or your, your happiness that um, your backups work, then... You know, you just wasted a bunch of money moving data needlessly from from a server uh, or from a from a computer. So verify and test your backups. Um, I, I I've I've done this where I've had a backups that I thought were working that w were actually not. And had I not actually gone in to, to test my backups or at least look and see if if that stuff is there, I would have been in deep doo doo um, as as far as that. So um, it's it's pretty easy with the OS backups. Um, if you you know, I would say. Once a year, if you want to go through and uh, do a full recovery from Time Machine or Windows Backup onto another computer, if you have it, um, have those resources, do it. Um, you don't have to do this all the time, but you know, maybe once a month, just take a peek at your backups, make sure everything's cool. Um, some of the tools, uh, Nova Backup, for example, if you're running it on a server, can send you emails when backups complete. Now, that's not verifying your backups, but that's directly, but it's at least letting you know it's backing something up, and you can go in and, and sort of poke around. Do that, especially for your most critical data, because if you don't, you know, again, if we're looking at keeping this stuff 30 years, it's great you have a backup drive that's sitting on a shelf uh, for your most important data, but the lifetime of that drive, or, or the magnetic material on that drive, or the SSD, if you're using that, or even the optical media is has a shelf life, and so if you don't go in and verify that your backups are still there and working, uh, you could assume something's there when it isn't. And going back to uh, like pictures or, or analog mediums, you know, you could look at a, you could store a picture poorly, and it would be faded and scratched and ugly, but you still know it's a picture. It doesn't work the same way for digital mediums. If you did that with a hard drive where the magnetic material degraded, you're probably not getting any of that data back. And so it's really important that you verify and test all your backups from time to time. You don't have to be OCD about it necessarily, but figure out a schedule um, and adhere to it, and test your backups. It, may feel like it's a waste of time um, to verify something that's already functioning, but the digital world is constantly changing and living, and, and some of this stuff is just amazing technology, but with, with all that going on, you know, you can't, we, there are pictures that date back to the 1890s, and we haven't even had digital that long to really say, uh, and I don't even know if data's been around that long other than maybe on punch tape. Uh, at least since, since since we've had it, and it's still not even close to the oldest pictures that we have as a race. So, uh, verify and test your backups is the point. So, with that, I didn't mean to scare you on that last slide, by the way, <laughs> but I wanted to hit that home. Um, now we have a Q&A. Uh, feel free to, if you have any questions about anything that I talked about, or if you felt I missed a topic, uh, or something important you wanted to go through, by all means, uh, let's, let's hash it out. Uh, I would like for everybody to have an idea, if you weren't doing backups, of what you need to do now, and if you already were, the hope is that um, now you have a, a better idea on how to improve them. Well, thanks. I'll have you know this was my first presentation, so I hope I did okay in your eyes. If not, feel free to let me or Photobiz know, and if you do want more content like this, uh, I realize it's not very uh, specific to photography, um, but digital is in our everyday lives, so at least in a, in a periphery sense, uh, I felt like it was still important. So uh, with that in mind, again, thanks for coming out. 
We'll see you next time. Thanks, Tim, for taking the time to present this information to us today. And I'd like to thank everybody who joined us. A recording of today's webinar will be posted on the PhotoBiz YouTube channel at youtube.com slash photobiz. Also, be sure to check out our blog and watch your email for updates about future webinars. Our next webinar will be on improving your SEO ranking and conversion rates with our own SEO and social media specialist, Andy, on Tuesday, August the 13th at 2 p.m. Thanks again, Tim. That concludes this episode of PhotoBiz Live. Have a great day, everyone.